Hello, friends. Welcome to Fresh Perspectives from Amp Recover. I'm honored to be joined today by Dr. Thomas Bird, the founder of the Nashville Sports Medicine and Orthopedic Center. Dr. Bird, how are you today? I'm doing very well. Good afternoon. It's very kind of you to have me here. Well, we're excited to get to uh, talk to you today. Uh, and you have a, a very nice nickname as the godfather of hip arthroscopy. Uh, would love to learn a little bit about you. What's your background? What led you down this career path into a focus in uh, hip arthroscopy? Well, you're not the first one to mention that about the godfather. Whether that's true or not, I think it's for others to judge. Uh, but if that means that I sort of preach a, a sense of responsibility and reasonableness for what people are doing in the world of hip arthroscopy, then, then I'm certainly okay with that moniker. I hope you'll forgive my casual attire. I'm out here in Denver just sort of biding my time for our game tonight against the Broncos. And uh, the environment here is a little spartan. I'm just in the, uh, the quarterback's meeting room. They were uh, gracious enough to let me sort of camp out in here for being able to do this interview. I'd love to talk a little bit more about the NFL and your work as a team physician with the Titans in just a few minutes, but let's take it back uh, a little bit. And, and throughout your career, how have you seen hip arthroscopy change? Uh, and what do you envision uh, the future of hip arthroscopy to look like? I think as we look at the future, it's certainly important to reflect back on the past because uh, in, in my training, I did a sports medicine fellowship with Dr. James Andrews in Birmingham. And then I did a total joint fellowship at New England Baptist in Boston. And my main focus has always been sports medicine. I just figured there's enough people come limping in to see the sports medicine doc that really need a, a total joint replacement that either I ought to do a good job with them or send them on. And I've been, my focus has been on sports medicine. At this point, I haven't done a joint replacement in well over a decade. And, uh, most of my practice has sort of evolved towards this hip preservation. And, and there's nothing I'm doing that I set out to do, it's more just the way my practice evolved. Um, looking at some of these innovative things, I would have to qualify any statements I make by saying that I'm the sort of person that likes to do everything the exact same way every time forever. And it's certainly advantageous with my OR team because they can anticipate what I'm gonna be doing and it makes for a great, a lot of synchrony with our environment and operating room. But with this hip arthroscopy stuff, you really have to keep your head on a swivel because it's changing so quickly. I didn't just wake up one morning with this wild idea saying, hey, I think I want to scope a hip. And anything I've done, and I feel like any innovations we've made were, were simply out of necessity because the alternatives were less appealing. The first hip scope I ever did was in 1990. One of my partners had a 16-year-old kid with loose bodies in his hip two years following closed treatment of a nastabular fracture, and she was gonna do an arthrotomy and open them up and take out the loose bodies and said, well, what do you think about trying to take them out arthroscopically? And I thought, I've never heard of such a thing, but I thought, hey, as long as we don't do something dumb like cut the femoral nerve, we'll try, and when it doesn't work, you can flip them over and do the arthrotomy. Well, the bottom line is it worked, and about once a year over the next couple of years, I'd have another loose body that would land on my doorstep that we would address. And that's really all we knew about. And then after a couple of years, one of the physical therapists that worked with these patients came to me and said, you know, I've rehabbed these people, these loose bodies in their hip. He goes, I think my brother's got loose bodies in his hip. He'd been in a motorcycle accident 14 years before. Uh, his hip would be giving out him. He had to quit work framing houses because he never knew when it would give out. We did all the studies, they were all normal. And we thought, well, maybe you've got some sort of radiolucent loose body that we can't see on these studies. But after 14 years of symptoms, maybe it's not premature to take a look. So he went into his hip and what he had was a big bucket handle tear of the labrum flipped up in the joint, which we excised. And after 14 years of symptoms, his pain was gone. And that's when a little light went off in my head and said, you know, there's other things going on inside the hip besides loose bodies. We're just not very good at diagnosing it. And that's sort of what put me on this track, realizing that there really was a place for the arthroscopic approach in the hip and how that's really blossomed into more true joint preservation as we're doing a lot of things, not only to improve the quality of people's lives, improve their function, but also hopeful that we can improve their long-term outcomes. And when it comes to returning uh, people to that high quality of life and to that function, you mentioned their physical therapy and rehabilitation. 
Uh, obviously, the surgery is critically important. How important is what happens after the surgery with regards to physical therapy and rehabilitation? Well, the only thing that comes close to being as important as what happens after the surgery with the rehab is what happens before the surgery, oftentimes with the rehab, because so many of these hip disorders that we deal with revolve around this condition called femoral acetabular impingement, which is just a 50 cent word for the way somebody's hip forms when they're a little kid. It's sort of like the front end of your car being a little out of alignment. It leads to some uneven tread wear. And over time, as you start to flip off the tread, that's when you start to feel it. So what we're finding is for a lot of these individuals, it doesn't matter how gradually the symptoms came on or how acutely the symptoms came on, it's still just the culmination of the cumulative effect of a process that's been developing since childhood. So often they've been compensating for the problem long before this hip becomes symptomatic and realize there's an issue. And oftentimes they have these other compensatory disorders that can obscure the diagnosis, can make it difficult to sort out that the joint's the problem, but also all these other secondary things need a lot of attention on the front end to put the hip in a better position for surgery to potentially be successful. Because we know the success of the surgery is very much dependent on the rehab process afterwards. So anything you can work on on the front end puts the person in a much better position for a successful outcome from the surgery. You have a history of working with elite athletes uh, across a wide number of sports. Anything that you've learned in working with elite level athletes and returning them to the highest level of play that also translates over to working with an everyday patient and just getting them back to a high quality of, of living? So many things that we do, especially on the hip front, really parallel everything else that we do with sports medicine. And that's where I, I think I, uh, I had the blessing back in 1997 when the Houston Oilers moved to town and became the Tennessee Oilers. In the first couple of years, they were the Tennessee Oilers before they became the Tennessee Titans. And those experiences have helped me immensely. And it's certainly a blessing to be able to work with incredibly talented, highly motivated athletes. It can certainly make you look good as a surgeon, but also there's much about those experiences that carries over into dealing with recreational athletes and just people who are trying to have a better quality of life. We've seen uh, an increase in technology lately across healthcare, uh, and specifically in the last six months, a rapid increase due to COVID-19. What have you seen that, that you like in regards to, to telemedicine, possibly re remote patient monitoring um, that's been kind of enacted due to the pandemic? And, and what do you think uh, is going to kind of last post-pandemic and carry on to continue to help providers and patients? It's pretty remarkable because in February, if you asked me to define telemedicine, I would have probably scratched my head over a little bit. I, I kind of acknowledge that it exists and figure somewhere being probably years from now, I would probably start to sort of kicking and screaming come into the world of telemedicine. Uh, but it, it's amazing that within about a week, I went from being completely computer illiterate to being uh, fairly facile with using telemedicine. Uh, not on my own, I have a difficult time turning a computer on, but with the team around me, I, it turned overnight into being an incredible resource for being able to continue to care for people and individuals uh, through the, this sort of tragic pandemic that we've all been experiencing. And, and, and as somebody said, sort of the genie's out of the bottle. I think once it, this experience is out there, it's not like it's going to go away, uh, hopefully when the pandemic goes away. But it's just a, a, an asset for, for being able to care for people. And, and, and so much of what we do revolves around quality of life. And quality of life is more than just surgery. It's more than just rehab. Uh, but how we can integrate that for patients without disrupting their life. And certainly in, in my practice, most of my patients come from out of state. So it's a long trek to come see me. And we're learning that there's so much we can do uh, through some of these uh, virtual meetings uh, to learn so much about the patient and try to decide is it worthwhile for them to make the journey to see me? Do we have something that we can genuinely offer them? Uh, and, and I think we're, we're still just barely scratching the surface. You mentioned that you're there in Denver. You're on the road as a team physician with the Tennessee Titans, formerly the Oilers. Um, can you tell me about uh, 
what you've seen in regard to getting an NFL team back on the field, it, it seems like a tremendously heavy lift. How impressive is it to you that the NFL is back playing this week? I think it's incredibly remarkable. Um, and I think for me, I feel a very passive participant, uh, mostly just like kind of being at home. I'm just waiting for somebody to tell me what to do and when to show up and what to do when I get there. But, uh, and, and that's where the commitment of the NFL has been remarkable. Uh, and I would have to definitely give a, a shout out to Alan Sills, who's the uh, chief medical officer for the NFL, who's been a, a friend for years before he took on that position. He's a brilliant neurosurgeon from Vanderbilt who grew up around football. He's passionate about it. He's incredibly smart because, uh, you know, how's a neurosurgeon prepare for this pandemic? But uh, like most things, uh, surrounding yourself with incredibly talented people, and they've done a remarkable job and, and nothing's perfect and, and everything is a work in progress. We'll simply have to adapt to whatever sort of circumstances we find ourselves in. So that, I really think the NFL has certainly been the model for it. And as we uh, conclude here, I know you're uh, very busy on the speaking surf circuit, doing a lot of different conferences. Uh, why is it important for you to help impart some knowledge to young people that are just beginning their career in healthcare? And um, what are some of the lessons that you try to leave with them as you are uh, speaking to that younger generation? Well, it, it, it's interesting because back when we first started doing this, there were a few of us yahoos, a few of us cowboys out there doing hip arthroscopy. And, we could basically recite each other's lectures and meetings because there, there's only a handful of them. And none of us were particularly good scientists. I, I would have to say that for me, the, the, the only real contribution I've made is, is keeping track of our data, being able to share our experiences with others, what's worked and what hasn't worked so they can learn from our experiences. I remember a quote, my, my father's chief of surgery was noted to say one of the residents, he said, Son, you don't have to learn all the mistakes and complications for yourself. You can read about a few of them. Well, for a lot of people out there, they don't have to learn all these things on their own. We can teach them and share with them a lot of the things that have worked for us and the missteps that we've made so others don't have to re repeat that. But what's really exciting in today's world is I think the sky's the limit because uh, we've got some incredibly brilliant, young, talented scientists who are really going to carry this whole thing to a whole new level. And at this point, I'm just excited to, to sort of sit back and watch what some of these folks are capable of doing. Well, Dr. Bird, certainly appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much for your insights, as well as for your leadership. Great. What a great way to spend a few moments before a game tonight. And uh, I certainly want everybody out there to be safe.